So how's everybody doing? This is PR with the first iteration of the Throwing Snowballs podcast with PR. So this is something that's been in the works for a while. I, uh, I still am someone who wants to be part of the other podcast that I'm a part of, the Two Birds and a Third football podcast, which I do have a lot of fun with. The only issue is the fact that I uh, I don't have as much time to work on that. I feel like I had a great thing going, DJ, Josh, and Ricky, and I think that, you know, it's a fun thing that we do. It's just that, and I've told them a few times, that I am not as available with that. Um, it's tough with the hours that that podcast goes on for four people and it's very difficult to have all of us at one time usually we record at night at around seven i usually go to sleep at around eight eight thirty uh, because i have a son when we started it none of us were married none of us ha- had had kids ricky was ricky space cowboy 17 subscribe to me if You know, you want to see good Dallas Cowboys content or good Dallas Cowboys videos because he's a very knowledgeable fan. I'm sure most of the people who watch me are already kind of subscribed to him as it is. But the way that it was back then was, you know, Ricky wasn't even in college. I think he just graduated high school. So we had more time as it was. But at this point in time, you know, Josh is married, he has a kid, I'm married, I have a kid, Ricky works for him not so good hours, I'm not really going to go into it, but it it's just easier for me not to be on there as much, and usually when I'm on there, I'm usually walking my dog while I'm on there, so it's just not an ideal situation for me, but I'm still planning on being on it as much as I can. I love it. You know, it was a it was a pet project with Josh, DJ, and I. We would go to this one bar called Tommy's in the South Bay area of California. And we would always sing karaoke. We'd watch football every Sunday. And we always found is that we had, you know, good views on football. We were very knowledgeable and intelligent about football. And we'd talk about it the whole time. You know, it would even get in the way of us watching the game. We would just continue to talk about it. You know, this is something that we were all extremely interested in. And we loved football. You know, it was it was all we could talk about. You know, we didn't talk about other stuff. We talked about football, what was going on on the screen. And we were always like, we want to create something in which we're talking about football. And yeah, it never really took off. You know, we really never got popular. It was never really, you know, Never on like iTunes or no one, you know, really big was like, oh, you know, I really want to listen to Two Birds and a Third Football podcast, but we didn't do it for the, I didn't do it for the views. I did it to talk about football because it's something that I really like to do. And I really wanted to make this an outlet for me to talk about football and talk about other stuff on my mind, try to stay away from, you know, the BS and the politics. Maybe if there's sports politics, I, you know, you talk about it. But I found that because I was so busy all the time, I wasn't able to talk about what I wanted to talk about. And that's not their fault at all. It's not their fault. You know, you have a podcast that's about an hour long, usually goes over an hour, and you you're, you find that there are things that you're just not able to talk about. And you want to keep it during a point in time where it's, something that's going to keep people engaged. Maybe you let people know what you're going to talk about so that they can scroll ahead. I think YouTube has that thing where you can see, that mechanic where you can see everything that is going to be talked about. It's actually labeled on the screen. So I decided, hey, you know, I can make my own type of audio recording where I'm talking about issues when it comes to football when it comes to like my personal life. So, you know, I don't have to be going on Twitter and talking about that all the time. 
you know, I can have an outlet to just do that, just kind of like a diary or a journal, just like put it out there and, you know, people can listen to what I have to say or they don't have to listen to what I have to say. So I decided, I think a few weeks ago, that I was going to do this just a personal thing. You know, if if I want to add more people as guests, I can do that as well. And I still want to be a part of Two Birds and a Third Football Podcast. It's just sometimes tough to get all four of us on. And I've noticed that, you know, if I'm if on Tuesday I'm not like, hey, you know, let's do this tomorrow, it's probably not going to happen because we usually do the podcast on Wednesday. And the hours are just not that good for me uh, to do on a usual basis. But I, I know they'll still let me on if if I want to be on, but... This is not a grievance with the Two Birds and a Third football podcast. I'm not fighting with any of those guys. I still res- have mad respect for all of them. Um, I'm still going to, I hopefully still going to be involved. Hopefully they don't see this and they, <laughs> or listen to this and they're like, oh, you know, he's ripping us apart. But I, th- I think that it's a sentiment with, with all of them. You know, it's a situation where our lives have kind of like gone apart. And of course, Ricky has a, pretty respectable number of like 6,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel. So that's good. That's good for him. And I definitely support him. And, you know, if, if, if space cowboy 17 ever comes up as a topic, of course, I'll always speak about him in a positive light. He's a good guy. So I decided, you know, I, I talked to my, my internet acquaintance, my longtime internet acquaintance slash friend, uh, Phil Talk Sports, Phil Nunziata. I've known him for 10 years. Uh, he's been a part of my uh, Eagles fans react videos. He's been part of both of them. He's just a, he's a very reliable guy. And I'd like to have him on here at some point in time to talk about the Eagles or talk about some other stuff. But, you know, I was like, I told him about what was going on and what I was thinking. He was like, oh, you know, that's a great idea. Uh, and I, he was like, do, do you have any names for it? I was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any names for it at this specific time. I was thinking, you know, either like a football term or a Philadelphia Eagles fan inside joke. And I was spitballing and thinking about, you know, unnecessary roughness podcast with PR or the muff pump podcast with PR or the coaches challenge podcast with PR And I couldn't think of any Philadelphia Eagles fan inside jokes. He was like, why don't you try throwing snowballs at Santa Claus with PR 52? And I was like, oh, that sounds like a really good idea. I'm just going to take out the Santa Claus part because I don't I don't want to be I don't want to be associated with uh, throwing snowballs at Santa Claus, which, you know, whenever people are like talking about Eagles fans in a negative light, they'll always say, you guys threw snowballs at Santa Claus. I was like, I was born in 1989. Okay, I I bear no responsibility to what anybody did back in like 1967 or 1968, whenever that happened. Also, there isn't any physical proof that snowballs were were thrown at Santa. There's no video evidence. Just like there's no video evidence that the Immaculate Reception was caught or wasn't caught. So I just decided on the Throwing Snowballs podcast with PR52 because, again, it's kind of got like Eagles fan motifs because Eagles fans are known for throwing snowballs. They're known for throwing other things, and they're at this point after winning Super Bowl 52, they're known for eating the excrement of um, farm animals. So that's always great. (laughs) But, um, you know, this is going to be about a maybe like, 30, 35 minute podcast where I just talk about things that are on my mind when it comes to, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles off the cuff. It's in a small sense scripted. I'm just having all the things that I want to talk about and just putting it right out there in the open. And of course, you're free to subscribe. I have created a, a, a PR52 Twitter page. I'm not going to impede on the two birds and a third football podcast thing. I know that I I use that as a personal Twitter page. I used, I used to use that as just a way to like rant and a way to like talk crap about people. But I I really wanted to stay away from it because I, I don't want to be about negativity when it comes to trolls on Twitter. I understand that it Twitter is like a cesspool. It's kind of like a cancerous society. So I I just kind of like want to stay away from that. But 
I'm going to get to the topics that I'm going to discuss in this podcast. This is kind of like the introduction slash, you know, discuss uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing kind of thing. So the first thing that I'm going to discuss is a grievance that I had in the last game with the Dallas Cowboys. Now, I hate the Dallas Cowboys. They're my least favorite team. I hate them so much that I married a Cowboys fan. The other thing that I'm really, really big on is I'm big on the decorum of the game. Okay, I'm a very old school football fan. I'm one of those football fans. I'm all about defense. I'm all about running the football. I'm not as big of a fan of the fact that it's such a quarterback driven league. I'm not a big fan about weird group celebrations where whenever you get a turnover, you have to run to the other end zone and just, you know, kind of, you know, act like a fool to the camera. I'm not a huge fan of that. The other thing that I'm not a huge fan of is running up the score. And that's what the Dallas Cowboys did. Now, I can understand, you know, obviously, the, whoever is going to attack me on this is going to attack me on the thought process of, well, the, the name of the game is to score the most points. If your defense isn't good, you need to stop your opponent. If you can't stop them, then it's your fault that they're running the score up on you. Totally understand. And I totally understand that in the standpoint of a real game time atmosphere. Okay. When there are chances that the other team might have to score points. I get it. But when the other team has no timeouts remaining, zero timeouts remaining, and I think it was uh, Andy Dalton, he threw a nice pass over the middle. By the way, Andy Dalton was my fantasy quarterback this week. Michael Gallup was my fantasy receiver. Because I just, I just knew that the Eagles were just going to lay a giant egg on defense. But he threw a nice pass on third and like 12. And it was a pass interference. And basically the Cowboys took over the 13 point lead. Eagles have no timeouts left. There's like two minutes and 40 seconds left on the clock. All that you literally have to do is kneel the ball three times and kick a field goal. That's all you have to do. Okay, the Eagles could not score to save their lives. Some of my f- favorite, most smart plays in NFL history, in, or in, at least in my team's history, are when a player makes a smart decision by kneeling the ball. They could, they have a full shot to the end zone. They could run to the end zone. Brian Westbrook, two thousand seven, against the Dallas Cowboys, up by four points, and John Runyon. Tells him, hey, take a knee at the one-yard line. Do not go into the end zone. Get the first down, take a knee, and then we'll three-kneel it to the end of the game. To go six and eight at that point in time. It was week 15. That's a smart play. Brent Selleck in the snowball against the Lions. Where he catches a first down pass and he starts running down the field. And then he just slides in the snow like a little kid. Smart play. Miles Sanders last season against the Dallas Cowboys. He had a chance to score. We had a chance to run up the score. He took a knee. Took a knee. Now, here is why it was really, really dumb for the Cowboys to run up the score. Because they have to go the next week. They have to look at the Philadelphia Eagles right in the eye and say, Hey, we need you to beat the Washington football team. Because the Washington football team, they swept the Dallas Cowboys. They swept them during the season. They swept, they beat them on Thanksgiving, and they beat them like three weeks earlier. Which the Washington football team never, almost never did as the Redskins. But they need the Eagles to beat the Washington football team to go to their precious playoff spot. So what you're saying is you expect the Philadelphia Eagles to play their best game of the season. Which they're going to have to be because the Washington Red, the Washington football team, excuse me, I almost said the Washington Redskins. The Washington football team has one of the better defenses in the NFL. Now, the Eagles could win this game. Understand that. We don't even know if Alex Smith is going to play. 
I think that it was kind of ridiculous for the Washington football team to rely on Alex Smith because of his injury history. If I was Alex Smith, I would never play again, by the way. I mean, that injury was gruesome. The recovery was gruesome. He almost was never able to... He almost died. His poor wife. He almost died. She probably has a heart attack every time that he's on the field. I remember the first game he played was in the rain against the Rams. I'm... I wouldn't want to live in her head. But you effectively need the Philadelphia Eagles to win this game in order to go to the playoffs. You expect to run up the score on a team and then have that team look back at you and say, yes, yes, sir, we'll win the game for you so that you can go to the playoffs. That's a joke. That's a joke. Now, I don't believe in that teams tank on purpose. I think that that's like a made-up fan myth. And I'm not saying that the Eagles will will try to throw the game. But uh, in my head, I'm thinking, man, if I was the Eagles, I would just throw the game. Because this is, this is a game the Eagles, as an organization, have no incentive to win. Okay? Because if they win this game, they could keep their head coach. They could keep their defensive coordinator. Uh, there would be no changes in the front office. They would have a lower or a what a lower draft pick. The Eagles have no incentive to win this game outside of the fact of personal pride that Doug Peterson's coaching for his job or some of these players are playing for their careers. Which is why I don't believe in tanking. Tanking isn't a real thing in in, in the NFL. Maybe it is in basketball, but it's not in the NFL. Teams do not try to tank in the NFL. As you can see, the Jets could have gotten Trevor Lawrence. They won two games. The Jets are a better team than a lot of people give them credit for. But I just want to let it out there. And I understand people might be like, why are you being such a whiner about this? Well, it's just my personal belief system. I don't believe in running the score up. I believe that running the score up contributes to bad karma. And this is a situation because the Eagles really don't have to win this game. Congratulations. You, you could have just knelt the ball <laughs> and then it would have been over. But instead, you didn't. Melt the ball, kick a field goal. Really, the game is over because it's, two pos- it's over a two-possession game. There's no way the Eagles are going to come back. There's no reason for you to score. It's just bad karma. That's just my personal perspective as a person who is kind of like, a, like an old-school football fan in the sense of I believe in like respect and decorum. There's no respect when you're... When you're running up the score, Run, running up the score is kind of like a college football thing. When you're you're playing against your biggest rival, like Mississippi plays against Mississippi State, right? You're just running up the score on them, throwing when you don't need to. So I can completely understand, you know, just wanting to completely bury an opponent. I get it. I get it. I get it. So the next topic that I'm going to go to is officiating. The officiating in this game wasn't that bad, but there was one call that was really bad in this game. And I'm not saying this as a person who's going to say, oh, you know, it, it was, it was the reason why the Eagles lost. No, 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 no. The Dallas Cowboys were a better team in almost every way, shape and form. They were the better team and the better team won, but there was a play. I think it was in the fourth quarter. The Eagles were down by 13. And Jalen Hurts was running out of the pocket. He got a first down and he got tackled to the ground. And as he was going to the ground, it appeared that the ball popped out and the referees called a fumble. First and foremost, I completely agree with the call. You're just going to call a fumble there because the way that refereeing in the NFL is shaped up is the fact that it happens so fast that you have to make a, 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 a gut check decision. Because there have been times in which a fumble occurs, the ball comes out, but the referees call kind of like down by contact. And the the defender will scoop the ball up and they'll run to the other end zone and they'll be like, yeah, we scored a touchdown, but they'll be like, no, it was down by contact. Basically, even if they reverse the call and call it a fumble, that touchdown won't count. And teams have lost because of that. So it's very unfortunate when that stuff happens. But under further review, clearly Jalen Hurts' left knee 
hits the ground before the ball starts to pop out. He kind of the ball starts to pop out when he's rolling. And his knee was already down by that point. And the NFL officiating Twitter page had to defend this call. And of course, you know how I feel about Alberto Riveron. I think he's one of the most incompetent people in the world at his job. Like, Alberto Riveron is one of those uh, VP of officiatings who, you know, even if his officials are doing poorly, he'll still be like, they're doing, they're, they're doing such a great job. They're so great. And that's a, I'll be doing an impersonation of Alberto Riveron. Um, it might sound like a racist impersonation, but no, this is exactly what he sounds like, right? He got on the Twitter page. He made a video. And he was like, in the Philadelphia Eagles-Dallas Cowboys game, there was a play where the Philadelphia quarterback was running and the ball came out. And the ball came out. The ball was moving before his left foot hit. Yeah, of, of course the ball was moving. Because his arm was moving. Yeah, his ar- the ball was in his arm and his arm was moving. So, of course, the ball was moving. But the ball was not loose. It was a bad call. It was an awful call. And of course, what I will say is that the reason why I'm not as upset about this call is because it didn't cost the Eagles the game. Because there is no... The Eagles had been in Cowboys territory so many times and just got no points out of it. That it, it probably would have been completely meaningless. But it is it is very interesting that he decided, you know, I'm going to come out and I'm going to defend this call when there's no defending that call at all. Most of the calls he tries to defend are just completely wrong. And, you know, officiating in the NFL is bad because there aren't enough officials on the field. There's too much inconsistency when it comes to calls. There's pass interference and holding on every play. And they just miss stuff. People will say like, oh, you know, refereeing is is biased and they're purposefully doing bad calls. No, I've, I've been an official before. It's just that you miss stuff. You miss stuff. But 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 I've never been an official with instant replay. And when hit instant replay, when they're looking at instant replay and they're missing stuff, then there's an issue there. There's a huge issue there. So I'm not going to get that worked up about it. Obviously, I did get a little bit worked up about it. But even Dean Blandino, who, you know, Cowboys fans will remember, was the one who uh, made that Dez catch, no catch call as the VP of officiating, the whole process of the catch kind of thing. So they hate him, but, I mean, my wife hates him. Every time Dean Blandino's on, on the screen, she gets, like, PTSD. But that wasn't the reason why we lost. The reason why we lost this game was poor coaching. And I know we're a little bit kind of like stretch for time here. So I'm not going to go into my whole grievance about coaching. I'll probably do that at the end of the season when it's time to talk about Doug Peterson and what might happen to Doug Peterson. Doug Peterson isn't a good coach. I'm just going to lay that out on the table right there. There are, you know, I am not a coach. I, the only coaching that I've ever done in football is on, in Madden, right? I feel like Madden has taught me football 101. And Doug Peterson, he doesn't know football 101. There's a huge problem when you are the, the main play caller on a football team but you didn't have any experience play calling at anything higher than high school football. That's a huge problem. And it became clear in this game because the first 10 plays look great. He scripts the first 10 plays of the game. Go down the field, matriculate the ball down the field. Miles Sanders gets a touchdown. Then on the next drive or two drives later Jalen Hurts throws this beautiful 81 yard pass to Deshaun Jackson I understand it's his first game back in like eight weeks or something like that maybe it's not eight weeks but six seven weeks and of course he kind of rolls into the end zone 
And Kelly's like, does he really have to do that? My wife. And I'm, and I'm like, um, yeah, it's Deshaun Jackson. He is 99% swag. That's it. He's 99% gloating and showboating. That's why Eagles fans have hated him for such a long time. That's like, that's like take it or leave it. That's the part of Deshaun Jackson where we'd be like, leave it. But he didn't do anything for the rest of the game. And the reason why was because he was held out of the game. And when he was in the game, he was just used as a decoy. He only had one target and one play that was supposed to go to him, and that was that play. We didn't see it for the rest of the game because Deshaun, or Deshaun Jackson had soreness. Remember when Deshaun Jackson was week to week in 2019? Yeah. Pepperidge Farm remembers. So, basically, we don't do anything in the second half. Doug Peterson looks completely clueless with game management. Uh, he punts the ball on fourth and three in, you know, the, what is it, the end of the third quarter. And then on fourth and 15, he goes for it. And Jalen Hurts throws a six-yard pass. I'm not going to blame Jalen Hurts there. He's a rookie quarterback. The defense sucks too, okay? And, and people might say, oh, it's because of the talent. We have a defensive coordinator in Jim Schwartz who has had talent in the past who have gone to other teams and have been doing well since then. Ronald Darby, Razul Douglas, Sidney Jones, Chandon Sullivan, doing better on the teams that they're at. Because they have an actual defensive coordinator on these teams that actually cares about the secondary. The reason why we get burned all the time is because we do not play press coverage. I always say this. I would rather uh, a corner play press coverage and get burned than a guy play five to eight yards off and get, you know, give up that much room, give up that much space. Because here's the thing. If you play five to eight yards off, you can do anything. You can do anything. You can do a, a slant. You can do in and out. You can do a corner post. You can do a regular post. You can do a go. You can do a stop and go. You can do basically anything on the route tree, a button hook, a curl. You can do anything like that. When you play press man coverage a lot – you can still beat press man coverage, but it's a lot more difficult to do. Of course, one of the big ways you can beat press man coverage is you know, making sure you have a strong receiver. The other thing you can do is pick plays, right? This is one thing that, you know, the staple of the Bill Belichick type of offense, pick plays. Have a guy pick and then have another receiver go free. Right, checkdowns. Tom Brady in in New England was huge on checkdowns for most of his career because of that, and it took it took teams a while to kind of understand this, and but they still could never stop it until Jim Schwartz is gone. We will never have a, a good defensive backfield. He only cares about the defensive line, and really, once Fletcher Cox was out of that game, we couldn't do anything. We were done. We were done. Couldn't do anything at all. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about is Jalen Hurts. And I am not going to stand here and criticize Jalen Hurts. I'm not. I'm not going to do it. Because Jalen Hurts has played well as a rookie. A lot of people, you know, they want to look at like RG3 and Dak Prescott as examples of, you know, if you don't do what they did and win games and have good stats, then you're not going to be a good player. That's not true. That's a fallacy. This is a complete fallacy. Some of the best quarterbacks that are in the Hall of Fame, right? Maybe they're not the best quarterbacks, but they're in the Hall of Fame, had horrible rookie seasons. Just nightmare rookie seasons. Jalen Hurts has played pretty well as a rookie. He's raw. He, 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 he's not ready to be the regular starter yet. He's not. He needs more development, which is why Peterson needs to be gone. Because it doesn't matter. Peterson, Peterson only develops D-linemen and running backs. 
maybe O lineman. That's it. That's it. Maybe tight ends too. But quarterbacks, I mean, Jalen Hurts is between a rock and a hard place. He played well at the very beginning of the game, which he did. He, he played really well. Perfect in passing. One touchdown. Managed the game really well. But he also got injured. He left with a bit of a core injury. But he didn't leave. He stayed in the game. But he had the core injury. Excuse me. And Doug Peterson left him in the game. That's going to absolutely ruin a quarterback. It's going to absolutely ruin a quarterback. Doug Peterson is not the right coach to develop Jalen Hurts. And if Doug Peterson is back next year, okay, well, you can expect another 4-5 four, four win season. Maybe less. Doesn't matter if Howie Roseman is back. I'm going to have to make a whole other podcast discussing Howie Roseman. I know I'm talking about Jalen Hurts right now. But as the game went on, you could clearly see that the same things that were hurting Carson Wentz, Jalen Hurts started to do. He started pressing down 13, third and 12. He threw in a really bad interception in the red zone. And that was, that was the straw that broke the camel's back because we could never come back after that. So... I'm not going to blame him for the loss because he he played pretty well at the very beginning of the game. He got a lot of compliments from the commentators. But we are a team that doesn't have a defense. We are a team that has to, especially on the back side, we're a team that has to outscore another team and score like 30-some-odd points, which we haven't scored 30 or more points all season. I think the most points we scored was against the Ravens, which was like 28 So it's just not happening. It's not happening. Jalen Hurts did the best he could. You know, right now he's kind of a limited quarterback in the sense of he's run first. He's not, he has not proven himself to be a pocket passer yet, which he's going to have to be in order to be successful in the National Football League. You have to be a player that can play the majority of the time in the pocket, kind of like Russell Wilson. When Russell Wilson came into the league, he wasn't a pocket passer, but he eventually developed into a pocket passer. With Jalen Hurts, I don't know if that's, I don't know if or when that's going to happen, and I'm not going to be one of those people, those Eagles fans, that goes all crazy and says, oh, you know, he had a few great games, he's the future. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that it's wrong to say that, It's just not fair to Jalen Hurts. Let him develop. Let him learn before we start throwing a a franchise quarterback in front of him, which wouldn't be fair. Jalen has the tools to be that guy. But the real question is, is he going to develop into that guy that who's going to be the franchise quarterback? Okay. So it's been about 35 minutes. I'm going to log off right now. If you would like to listen to more of these podcasts, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you follow PR52 on Twitter. This is PR52 with the Throwing Snowballs podcast. I uh, hope to see you guys next week. And, you know, of course, we're going to talk about, you know, season's end, the end of the road. Uh, as well we might talk about a little bit about the game but it's not really going to be that important because it's a meaningless game for the Eagles and I don't understand why it was flexed in the first place which is the most 2020 thing ever you know unironically it's happening in 2021 so you know we're just going to have a little piece of 2020 lingering into 2021 so remember subscribe to the channel PR52 follow the Twitter page which is also PR52, and uh, this is PR52 with the Throwing Snowballs podcast signing off from the first episode, and I hope you have a happy holidays and a happy new year. See you, everybody.